I'm Joey Spooner. I'm your host for today's webinar. Today, we're lucky enough uh, to have Chris Johnson here from iTrellis. I am from Combine University. I'm the Vice President for, uh, Mark, for um, Product Management and Community Development here. And also with me is Chris again from iTrellis. And Chris is the CEO of iTrellis. I'm going to let him share more about himself in just a second here, but we're excited about this partnership because this is one of our first companies to work with where they actually do a lot of portfolio management and Azure DevOps. So I know a number of you who are on this uh, webinar today are probably working with Azure DevOps, probably having a good time with it, maybe running up against some challenges. So Chris is going to be uh, sharing with us quite a bit about his technology, how it can really help teams and organizations benefit from Kanban, but also at the portfolio level, which is going to be a big deal, I think, days to come. All right, so Chris, I'd love for you to introduce yourself, tell us a little bit more about you, and also share some more about your product. So. Uh, Go for it, Chris. Thank you, Joey. I'd love to. Um, I'd like to start the presentation today with a little bit of gratitude. Um, I'd like to thank our partners at Combine University. We're thrilled to be here. I'd also like to thank our partners at Microsoft for the Azure DevOps Marketplace, the Analytics API, and the Extension Program. That's how we publish our software. And I'd like to thank uh, key members of the iTrellis team. Uh, my co-product owner, Lisa Milano, our designer, Matt Queen, our lead engineer, Matt Tabor, along with David Yeager and Young Chan Kim, and our quality assurance and video production uh, engineer, Greg Franz. Uh, my name is Chris Johnson, and I serve in many roles at iTrellis. Um, I'm a program manager, business owner, product owner, uh, technology solutions consultant. In a nutshell, I build end-to-end -end solutions in Azure. Um, I work with teams that practice varying degrees of Kanban, every day. And I'm here to share my experience and provide suggestions for the application of Kanban and Azure DevOps. And I would look at these as recommendations and not rules, at least not outside of your process template. Those are pretty fixed. Um, now I've got about 30 minutes of prepared material and I'd like to capture comments along the way or questions along the way. So if you can use the chat to send Joey uh, your questions, that would be fantastic. And then we'll hit some Q&A at the end. Now, when thinking about how to best showcase Kanban and Azure DevOps, I, wanted, I want this presentation to be engaging. I want it to be real. I want it to be something that people can latch on to. And so we're gonna be doing it live. Um, we're also gonna be doing the demonstration out of our QA environment. Uh, we're about to release the next version of Portfolio++ Plus Plus that I'm showing you today that has many of the Kanban features uh, that people have been asking us for in the community. So this webinar is very timely. Um, now, I've signed a lot of co client confidentiality agreements on behalf of iTrellis. And uh, another constraint is that I don't want to expose client data. Uh, that would be kind of a killer in my role as the data officer for GDPR compliance. Uh, so we're going to be doing the demo with our own live data and our own Azure DevOps organization here at iTrellis. Uh, this is going to allow me to showcase how we use ADO and how we apply Kanban on our product projects. Um, it will also provide a basis for the organizational maturity discussion around the usefulness of Kanban that I'd like to have uh, towards the end of this discussion. Uh, the last thing is that I'm assuming that people who would sign up for a webinar on this topic have a basic understanding of Agile principles, Kanban, and have worked with collaboration tools like Azure DevOps. And since I only have 30 minutes, I'm going to cover the basics of how we do Kanban, uh, along with some you know, key setup in Azure DevOps, and then we'll hit the QA. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna switch over to um, the presentation and turn off my video. Uh, because I'm on the west coast of the United States where there's a hurricane offshore and we lost power yesterday. And so things are a little uh, um, scary uh, when we lose power. So um, can you see my screen? You should be looking at a PowerPoint right now. Okay, cool. Yeah, we see the we see the deck in just regular deck mode, not presentation mode, by the way, Chris. Okay, um, that's yeah. fine for now. Okay. Um, so there are two types of Kanban and Azure DevOps. Well, there are four takeaways from this meeting that I hope you leave with. And the first is that there are two types of Kanban and Azure DevOps. Um, the second is that you wanna keep your Kanban simple. Um, the next is that you wanna keep your Kanban current. And 
the last is that Kanban helps with organizational maturity. So with respect to the two types of Kanban in Azure DevOps, there are two, the Sprint Task Board and the Portfolio Kanban. Uh, Portfolio Kanban is available through our extension, Portfolio++ Pro. Now teams use the Sprint Task Board. And in the best way to explain the Sprint Task Board is to level set uh, everyone with respect to the Scrum framework and how it works in Azure DevOps. Okay, you should now just see the Scrum framework on my screen full. Okay. Mm -hmm. So in a nutshell, um, and I think most people on this call should be familiar with this, I'll be brief, but we want all of the work for a project team here, all of the work that we can imagine, um, we want it in the product backlog. And then um, in a sprint setting, uh, typically we go about two weeks on our sprint teams, um, we plan out the next sprint with respect to that subset of work that's top priority here. And we take that into the sprint. We work on it in Azure DevOps. Um, we have daily scrum meetings, and this is where the sprint task board kicks in. This is where we do Kanban at the team level. And then ideally we kick it out at the end. And so the way that flows in Azure DevOps is like this. Uh, we've got a backlog. And uh, the taxonomy here is epics, features, user stories, and tasks. We'll talk more about this in a minute. The other thing that's really key is the iteration path. And so this is for your sprint planning. And so what I'm showing here is a sprint backlog where we've taken in work that was you know, here at the top of the backlog into the sprint. And as we work on it, we move tasks across the Kanban. So a couple key things to go over. We need to have a backlog. We need to have an iteration path. We need to pull work into the sprint so that we can see it on our Kanban. And then as we move cards across the Kanban, the different states, they move to closed. Okay, so the thing I like about this the most is it's just simple. And it's easy to explain to people moving cards across the Kanban. And we'll talk more about this as we get further into the demo. But as you, if you can get one team to do it, and you can get all of the teams to do it in your program, then you can start doing portfolio Kanban. Now, there's a lot of arguments around points and capacity planning and backlog grooming and how you get to this point. We're not going to cover that today. Let's just assume that we can pull work into a sprint we can look at it on the task board. We can move it across the task board. Okay, so now switching over to the demo. All right, so here I have Azure DevOps. Now this is the root level of Azure DevOps. This is the project directory. And we use projects in a variety of ways. Um, People tend to name them after domain areas of the business or project teams or platform teams or technologies. But the point is, is that all of the work in your organization that you're going to be working on should be somehow captured in one of these project areas. And the goal is to create a division of the work that people understand. And so it's pretty typical to see the directory structure of projects mirror the organizational structure, like the finance team. In this case, this is iTrellis, this is our company. The IP area is where we have our development work for Portfolio++. And we've got a business development team, design practice, our software engineering team. And so when we do work internally, we put it into these projects. So I'm gonna open up the IP project. And over here on the left, this is Azure DevOps. Um, you know, This is where you can put your documentation at the project level. Um, boards is where we're gonna spend the bulk of our time today. Um, but from a development standpoint, there's also repos, test plan repos, pipelines, test plans, artifacts. And down here, you'll see Portfolio++. 
Now, like I mentioned, we're going to be demonstrating uh, some of the new features that we're releasing with Portfolio Kanban today. So we're going to be demonstrating out of Portfolio++ QA. And we're not going to be talking about repos, pipelines, test plans, artifacts. If you want to talk about them, please give us a call. But today we're going to focus on boards and we're going to talk about backlogs, like I showed you in the Scrum diagram. Now, this is our backlog for our current development project. And as you can see, we have uh, the, at the top of the list is release 10, our customer appreciation release. This is an epic. This is a, a big thing that we want to deliver. And it's composed of um, these features, the things that it's going to do or enable when we release it in the um, next release. Below that, we have user stories and bugs. Um, but user stories are the, the ways in which these features are going to be used. And beneath that, we have tasks. As you can see, a lot of these are closed. And as I scroll up and down, you can see that there's a lot of work that goes into each of our releases. It's also overwhelming. And when I talk to clients or when I talk to other people, I don't whip out my backlog and show them all the cool work we're doing. It's it just it, it's a conversation non-starter. Uh, even if I take it down to this level, it's still difficult to talk to someone using your backlog. Um, but uh, the good news is that um, we can express it on a task board. And the way that we do that, I can't seem to move this. I'm going to have to move this over here. It's underneath the panel. I can't seem to move it. Um, and what we want to do is we want to pull work in here into the iteration path. Now, each one of these iterations ties back to this. So we've taken a bit of the work here in the backlog. We put it into our sprint backlog. OK, so I can click on this. And now it will show me a subset of all the work that we have in the backlog, but just the things that we're working on for this release. As you can see, we've been iterating for some time and we've had, we're on our 10th release, which is kind of cool. Um, but you can go back in time. Let me turn some of these things off. You can go back in time and let me switch it to the task board view because that's kind of the point of this discussion. Sorry about that. Um, here's the task board. And we treat bugs as user stories. So they sit here on the left-hand side. User stories, though, have tasks, as you saw in the backlog. And these are the things that the developers need to do. So epics decompose to features, features decompose to user stories, user stories decompose to tasks. Tasks are what we move across the Kanban. Now, Void of discussions about story points or how big things are. This is typically something that people can understand almost through the title by itself and the act of uh, accepting it into the sprint, working on it, and moving it to closed is meaningful. And as you close tasks, those closed tasks are in a state that we can measure. And if we can measure the state of closed tasks and stories and features over time, we can express, express it at the portfolio level. Okay, so um, this is the team Kanban. Now, as you can see, there's a lot of information here, a lot of work going on. Um, and what we want to do is we want to be able to see the work that this team is doing in conjunction with the other teams that are working in the uh, internal program here to release Portfolio++. Plus Plus. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come over here to the backlog. Oops, sorry. I'm gonna come over here to Portfolio++ Plus Plus QA. And I'm gonna open up a webinar demo and these are the epics that you just saw in the backlog. Well, specifically release 10 because it's the one we're working on and release 11. These have been closed, so they don't appear in the backlog. But we can show them 
on the roadmap so that you can show people context over time. Now, each of these, um, each of these epics, we can show their children uh, by clicking on this little chevron here. And that shows all of the features that I just had in the backlog. But this is in a roadmap. This is over time. And while this is helpful, it doesn't show the state of what's going on right now at the portfolio level across teams. It tells you where you've come from and where you're going. And that's awesome. Don't, don't get me wrong. That's why we built Portfolio Plus Plus initially. But then people started asking for the Kanban. And so we wanted to design something that was complementary to what Microsoft had already produced in Azure DevOps at the Sprint Task Board level. And so here, if we switch over to the Kanban view, now we can see epics. In the Sprint Task Board, you can only see the requirements level and the iteration level. In the Portfolio Kanban, you can see the higher level items. And we'll talk a lot more about this when we talk about process templates and how to set up for Kanban. Um, but at this level, two things. First, it looks like I'm the only one working on Portfolio Plus um, Plus, which is not true. But second, <laughs> you can see the work that we've closed and you can see the work that's active. Now that's not as useful as looking at the features. And as you dig down into the taxonomy, moving from epics to features, now you can start to see more true ownership. Like I'm ultimately responsible at the epic level for the release, but there are a lot of other people who are working on the features that make it happen. And so as you go down though, um, and you can see this list is getting rather long, um, we need to be able to manage this view as we look at it at this level across all the other teams because they have their cards too. So what I'm going to do now is show you how we do that. Now, this is our 2023 strategic plan. And um, when I take a look at it here, um, let me give me one second. I have to move this over so I can switch the view. Let's make it 2023. And today, or now the end of the year. Ah, whoops, I kicked myself backwards one. Okay. So now you can see the releases that we have in IP, but you can also see the other things that we're doing around the release of our software at the program level. So you can see that we have marketing campaigns. Uh, we built a, a relationship with Kanban University over the course of this year, and I'm looking forward to the global get together in November. Um, and then today we're doing Kanban University. I'm going to move that card to closed. We have to do design. We have to update our website. We have to update our Microsoft offers. We have to make sure we keep our people certified. I can tell a story looking at this roadmap of what we've had to do, what we still need to do, and where our milestones are. But what I can't do is see what's going on right now. So that's why we built the Portfolio Kanban. Now, as you can see, there are quite a few more epics and there are some features here because I'm looking at it using selected items. Now, what that requires, can, oh, there we go. Okay, let's put this back. Um, when I look at selected items, that's showing me exactly what I've selected in my roadmap. So what I have here, I can see here. But those selected items have children. And so if I want to look at features, well, now I can see all the features that all the teams are working on. And again, you know, we start having problems with information overload. So one of the things that we've built into this uh, 
portfolio Kanban that I'm very happy to announce because it's coming out shortly is the ability to segment the Kanban view by project or by team or by query. It just depends on how you build your roadmap. Now, what this does is it divides up the Kanban by area of ownership. So it's easier to see the work by team uh, in the Kanban view. And if one of these is super productive, you can close it and or move them around, change the order. Uh, the point is, is that this is the now. This is what's happening right now. So you've got a roadmap, but this shows state. And I find it to be super helpful as a program manager. Um, so this is um, the portfolio Kanban, which is uh, part of Portfolio++, Plus Plus, an extension for Azure DevOps. We've got some helpful links at the at the end of the presentation um, for people. Um, now, in terms of setup, where you can get Portfolio++ Plus Plus and other things. Now, um, the last thing is that we've got options where you can change the cards. Like maybe you don't want to show who it's assigned to. You just want to show that it's in flight. Um, maybe you don't want to redundantly show the state. Um, sometimes the state columns uh, are expressed as categories. Um, here, let's say, for example, you've customized your work items and you've got a whole bunch of states and your Kanban has gotten really wide, you can turn on state categories and all of the states in all of your work items will be mapped to the four uh, named categories that never change across any process template at Microsoft. I find this to be very useful, especially when teams feel like they've got uh, states that nobody else does and they customize the process template specific to their needs. Um, you don't want those things showing up sometimes. So this is super helpful too. Anyhow, when you make your adjustments, you can say okay, and then you can save your view and it'll save whatever view that you're looking at here. You can also name your views and you can share your roadmaps here if you want someone to take a look at what you've been working on. The only catch is that they need to have the same permissions that you do to see it. Okay, so this is how we do Kanban in Azure DevOps. There's two levels, Sprint Task Board and Portfolio Kanban, which is not time constrained. Both really help to limit work in progress, to make sure that you are working on the most important things. And I would like to assert that all of the benefits of Kanban that you read about can be found here. Now, in order to do Kanban in Azure DevOps, there are a couple things that I want to share in terms of setup. Um, we have talked to lots of clients over the past couple of years since we released our initial Kanban board. I'd like to thank any and all of you who've shown up today who have contributed to some of the ideas that I've demonstrated at the portfolio level. Uh, we really appreciate community feedback. Um, but there's some gotchas. gotchas. And so let's talk about um, process templates for a second. Uh, now, process templates deal with three things predominantly. They deal with work item types. So as you could see in the backlog, epic feature, user story, task, we have bugs. Bugs can have tasks, but we treat bugs as user stories. Um, and you may notice that these process templates all look a lot alike. They've just kind of had the labels changed for different communities. Um, and I guess I would say the uh, overarching continuous delivery agile principled space. Um, there's also a basic template that doesn't look like the others that just goes epic issue task, which is like uh, um, probably the most notable competitors taxonomy. Now we're using the agile process template here. And the way that that process template looks is this way. We've put two customizations into the process template. We've introduced the notion of an initiative and we've introduced the notion of an idea at the feature level as different from something that we think we're gonna build 
as a feature. We just put it in there. Now, if I can switch back to Azure DevOps, I'd like to go live again for a minute and talk about process templates here. This one is uh, QA safe. And actually what I'm gonna do is go back to the organization and open up all the process templates so that you can see basic Agile, Scrum, CMMI, the way I was just showing you in the PowerPoint. Now we've inherited from the Agile process templates that we could make some customizations. And the uh, customizations may be that we introduce a new work item type, in this case, initiative, uh, or we add states. So if we click on one of these, we can um, check the states of how that moves through the Kanban. Now, if you add any states, that's gonna be an automatic no new column uh, for this project and process template in your portfolio and on your task board. So you just be careful about the number of states that you add. And the last thing are the, uh, whoops, let's go back to levels, QA safe. The last thing are the levels. Now the sprint task board shows requirements and iterations. The portfolio Kanban shows requirements iterations and portfolio items. So you can show epics, you can show features, you can show um, the state of now at a variety of levels, depending on who you're talking to. So it's very important that when you define a work item type that you put it at the right level. Now, this, this second takeaway is that we strongly encourage you to keep Kanban simple. Keep it to the minimum number of columns. Keep work item types to the minimum required for your program. Practice abstraction. And you know, a user story is a user story is a user story, right? Like there are there are definite needs to add fields to a process template work item type, like a ticketing number uh, to a system. And you can always add, but if you change the defaults or you take away from the default work items, it's going to cause problems with Azure DevOps. So I would strongly encourage you not to do that. All right, so this was the process template that we were using for uh, what I just showed you. And uh, we try to keep our uh, columns pretty short. I think we've added, um, in the case of IP, we added a two states. Uh, let me go back to backlogs. Uh, move this out of the way, open up the sprint, and open up the task board. And you can see that we've got this blocked. Now, blocked isn't something that comes out of the box. We like to have a blocked column. I like to have a blocked column as a program manager. It gives me something to do. So <laughs> that's something that we've added. So try to keep it simple. Don't go crazy with customizations. Now, um, with respect to keeping Kanban current, and this is where we want to talk about organizational maturity, um, it should not be that big of an ask to have people show up on a daily basis for a seven to 15 minute scrum, maybe even 30 minutes, where at some point during that discussion, they talk about what they do yesterday, what are they doing today, and do they have any blockers? and to move their card across the board. If you can get teams to do that consistently, that's a very easy first step toward organizational maturity and consistency in Azure DevOps such that you can do program management and portfolio management. Now there's a lot of other stuff that goes into defining these cards like size, the story level, you know, estimated story points, uh, when you decompose into tasks, putting in concrete hourly estimates. But again, these things are pretty small, or they should be. And if they're not, it's nature's way of saying more decomposition. Um, we're not going to cover any of those things. We're just going to talk about how Kanban is useful. And I think that just getting people to move cards across the Kanban is useful because these states have meaning. And um, 
what I can show you is that when I say they have meaning, we can roll up done based on things that are closed. And that's how we calculate these green bars. And so Kanban plus roadmap equals a very effective portfolio management tool in Azure DevOps. All right. Um, that is what I came prepared to talk about today. And at this point, I'd like to uh, move into Q&A. Uh, I see awesome. that- Thanks, Chris. Yeah, let me stop my share. Okay, hi. All right, so I, I can run through the questions for you here, Chris, and, and great job, by the way, on the uh, presentation. There are okay. a lot of things I think from our, our, uh, our trainers and consultants in our space would be like, oh, wow, interesting, because there are a lot of things that we don't usually see paired up. Maybe we see it paired up behind the scenes uh, in the trenches, so to speak, uh, in our communications and our training. It does look a little different, which is kind of exciting to me because it shows us what you're discovering in the field when working with customers and what they need uh, for portfolio right. management, which is really interesting. We're trying to start with where they are now and where they are now is that blend of things like Scrum with Kanban. Maybe even story points are there sometimes like you shared for hourly estimates. That's just reality right now. Oh, well, I don't want to dismiss story points. I love them. <laughs> but I also didn't want to start any uh, debates on the call today, so. Right, well, and it's probably best that you you keep that that love for story points to yourself for now, even though there's probably a great debate. Come to San Diego with us, Chris, we'll debate yeah. that. I think people would love to hear your, your, your affection for them and understand why, uh, and maybe have an intervention with you possibly if we can. <laughs> uh, but uh, beyond right. that, let's take a look at the look questions here. To it. <laughs> Challenge accepted. <Okay. laughs> awesome, awesome. So we have about 12 questions that popped up during your talk. So the first one's from uh, Dimitro. He's asking, I do not know if it is going to be covered, but would it, it would be great to see if we could measure flow metrics, cycle time, lead time in a Kanban board in Azure DevOps. And is it possible to set WIP limits? That was kind of metrics and WIP limits was kind of his question. Yeah, so uh, yes, it is. And we use Power BI to do that. And that is not, I wanted to cover the basics today and that's a more advanced topic. And um, we'd be happy to show you how to do that. Um, I'm Chris at itrellis.com. I can show you examples of not that metric, but other metrics and how we get it in Power BI. Excellent. Okay, great. Uh, Alex Miner also asked a question. Uh, is the time frame for each epic determined by the items parented by that epic, by an iteration yeah. to which the epic is assigned, or by some other value? Okay, so um, I, ooh, I'm not sharing anymore, am I? Give me one second. Okay, I assume that we're referring to the uh, roadmap with that question in terms of the epic time box. Mm -hmm. And so this mm -hmm. is done um, one of a couple of ways. Um, like if we look at Kanban University, um, you know, that second to open, you can see that we've got a number of user stories that have been occurring over time, uh, plus this uh, Kanban University feature. And so what we do is we take the very first uh, work item and the very last work item. And so the very first work item, the very first day of the iteration that it's in, and the last work item and the last day of the last iteration that this one is in. Um, oh, one other nice feature that um, is show full labels. And so this is something that people have been asking for um, when you have like really big themes and you drop the children down um, and they're very short in short um, iterations. You can't see the titles. The other thing you could do is switch it to say weeks, but you know, still that's, it doesn't really work out so hot. Um, so the calculation is done based on the iteration path. And that's part of the reason that I went over it. That's a great question. All right. Awesome. Okay, great. And we have an anonymous question, which is, is it possible to create a portfolio from different project boards in the same organization? Yes, that's exactly what we're doing here. Um, and so if you look here, marketing is a project, IP is a project, design practice is a project. And this, is, this was a big missing in um, my opinion. I have to be careful there. 
uh, with respect to the design of Azure DevOps, because um, it, in my opinion, it was designed for cross-project efforts. Um, and just in terms of the way that it's built, but there was no way to show um, anything beyond Epic Feature Timeline inside of a project. And so this is why we built Portfolio++ in the first place, which was to give people some semblance of a roadmap across projects. Um, awesome. Yeah. Okay, well, just uh, for that anonymous attendee, they asked also, can you show how to do it? I don't know if you can do it quickly or if it's better to say, hey, you may want to check out uh, iCarlos's website to see how this is configured to get the full scoop on how to do it. Yeah, there are, a, I should have included this in the UR, helpful URLs link. There are a bunch, if you go to our website, um, www.itrellis.com, there is a page on Portfolio++ Plus Plus and a page on tutorials. On Portfolio++, Plus Plus, you can find our privacy statement, our license agreement, um, and on the tutorials, uh, you can see how to build a roadmap. And I would encourage everyone to check out the Mastering Azure DevOps series. It's five videos. And honestly, most of it is what you need to do in Azure DevOps. And it's only the fifth video where you go to the point of creating a roadmap. Now, in terms of creating a roadmap, it's really pretty simple. Um, you could, uh, on the fly roadmap, you select project. We're going to hit IP. We're going to hide all the closed epics. And we're going to just pick 11, 10. And let's say that we want to go to marketing. And we want to pick the uh, uh, Portfolio++ Plus Plus campaigns that go along with it. Save it. Done. And then you can you know, change your time and date range. OK. Um, I think that answered the question. Did that answer the question? Yeah. yeah. OK. I, I, it definitely gave them insight. And I put a link into Portfolio++ Plus Plus into our answer, question and answer system. So that should be able to, uh, I think, help out uh, with that question as well. Rosario Morales also asked a question. I'm trying to figure this out. He's asking, how can it be um, the Kanban view on dev.azure? So I'm guessing he's asking, Maybe it's just more like uh, awareness that there's a dev instance out there and that you can host this on the dev instance if you wanted to, to like play around with it, I guess. Maybe like run the portfolio plus plus in your dev instance for fun. Well, so you can, I think I understand the question. So if you go here to the marketplace, you can click on the marketplace, browse the marketplace. And <laughs> I'm very proud to say that we're currently being featured by Microsoft uh, here. If you click on it, um, then you can get it for free and you can use all of the features that I showed today, except for the ones that have a little blue badge um, because it's a free MIAM model. And so if you get it for free, um, it's pretty much as simple as um, defining the organization that you want to load it into. So if you have a dev and a prod uh, organization, you can load it into dev and try it. The other thing that you need to do um, is, let me get back out of this. The other thing that you need to do is um, uh, if you want to use the pro features, uh, this is a, a pro version, is you want to pick up a trial. And so you can use all of the features in Portfolio++ Plus Plus for 28 days, uh, but then you have to buy a license uh, to use Portfolio++ Plus Plus pro features after that, which I'd encourage you to do. All right, so uh, what's the next question? Uh, the next question is, is it possible to export the data like Azure Analytic Views, which can be exported to Power BI to create another visualizations and BI chart? Is that kind of what you guys already are doing? Like you said, you're using Power BI? No, um, so we're hitting the Analytics API and we this is a it, the extensions built in React. Um, and so um, the ability to export what you have out of Portfolio++, Plus Plus, we don't provide that. Um, Portfolio++ Plus Plus is a reader, um, and there are a variety of reasons for that. And, and what we have done is, um, let's say that you're looking at a strategic plan, you're in Portfolio++. Plus Plus. If you click on this, well, now you're passing uh, from our iframe into Azure DevOps, and you're actually working in Azure DevOps. So we've tried to make it pretty seamless 
Um, but if you want to get the data out of your DevOps backlog, you need to hit the analytics API and, and um, pull the data into something you can work with is the short answer. Yeah. 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 So it's, it sounds like it's possible with Power BI, but not with Portfolio++. Plus Plus. It's kind of outside the scope of what you guys are trying to do. Well, it's not just outside the scope. We don't want to do it. Um, that could open right. us up to all sorts of liability. So, right. so uh, you, we're pretty okay. locked down. You know, we're, you have to log into Microsoft. You have to use your, ad, you have to use your Microsoft credentials. You have to go through multi-factor authentication. You have to have the right permissions to the projects and be on a team. And then you can see the data. So, yep. I mean, we want to, we want to be as tight on data control as we can possibly be. Yeah. That's still excellent. Still giving people access. And flexibility. Yeah, it's quite the <laughs> uh, design. So yeah, that that's that's definitely it. So um, you know, the next question here is from Alexander Miner. Uh, he asked, "Are the columns on the Kanban view in Portfolio Plus Plus customizable, or are they only mapped to state?" So they're mapped to state, um, and you can customize them in your process template, um, but you can also um, change the view here, like I can hide proposed and I can hide um, completed. I only wanna see what's in progress and resolved. You know, it's kind of a, I don't know why you do this, but it answers your question. So you could have as many columns as you want and you can hide them or you can turn on, and this is my favorite trick, which is, let's put those back in here. And let's just imagine we had a bunch of other states. I can turn on, oh, this is in category, sorry. So these are just the states that we've collected across all the work item types. And if you turn on state categories, it will map all of those states to the respective category in the template. And, they're, and proposed in progress, resolved and completed is exactly the same across uh, basic, Agile, Scrum, CMMI. So if you inherit from them and use them in uh, DevOps services, that's exactly what you'll see. And then if you want to hide, you can hide. Very good. All right, so one other question came from Dimitro. He's asking about portfolio plus plus pricing. He said, is it based on the number of users? How is it priced out? Just so he knows. So yes, and also you can buy an unlimited license. So Portfolio++ Plus Plus is uh, $10 per user per month for an individual license and $200 for an organization license that offers unlimited use across the organization. And we have, um, uh, I'm happy to say that we have uh, had a lot of market um, adoption, um, like to see more. Uh, some of our, some of the clients that are using us are uh, very large and they have put everything into one um, organization for their company. And they have lots of projects and lots of people using it, same price for the enterprise license. So it just depends on how big your company is, whether you wanna go the individual license route or the organization route. Very cool, that's nice. Um, we have another question here. We actually have quite a few questions. We have 21 questions left. So let's see if we can get through them all, Chris. Uh, we don't, I don't know if we can, but we'll, we'll try our best. Um, so they asked, someone anonymous has said, this view, they're operational and tactical. Is there a strategic view in this plugin? I don't know. Can you maybe speak right to that here. a little bit? <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I think of the roadmap as, um, you know, the roadmap is based on your team's iteration paths and the work that they've pulled into those iteration paths. And so this is a Gantt chart style view of the work that is in the iteration path. Um, so I think uh, let's move this to months and let's open up what's coming. So it looks like you and, can kind of dig down and really pull out uh, tactical stuff pretty quickly then. Yeah. And show full labels. And so let's say that you're in an executive discussion and you're working at the portfolio level and you're talking about epics and features. You can drill down as necessary if they're asking questions about a top level item and, you know, well, why isn't this complete yet? I can see you're supposed to be delivering here in two days. Um, <laughs> these are bugs that we're cleaning up, just saying. 
Um, but the point is, is that um, this roadmap view helps you, coupled with Kanban, is that strategic view that we want to provide people for planning purposes. Um, and then there's another aspect that we haven't talked about at all today, which ties back to story points, which is capacity planning in terms of how to do capacity planning in your uh, iteration path. That's again, another more advanced topic. Uh, my goal is to get people using the Sprint task board and the portfolio view and using Kanban to talk about the here's the now. So like we can talk about what's going on right now. We can switch to the roadmap to talk about the context of that work over time. There's also dependencies, milestones, things that we um, put in here. This is another innovation that we're releasing, which is a milestone tray where you can drop it down and you can actually see um, our last release, our next release coming up shortly. Um, don't hold me to this since we're being recorded, um, but this was the stick of the end that we put out there. Um, and I definitely wanted to have these features working for this demonstration. So again, a shout out to my team. They worked tirelessly on some of the debugging over the course of the past two weeks. Much, much appreciated. Yeah, thanks so much for the hard work here, folks. So um, that probably answered that question. Somewhat related to this, uh, Derek Chinnett asks, what if the tasks in an iteration can't be completed? What do they do in terms of what happens to them in Azure DevOps? Well, we just move them to the next sprint. <laughs> So most, <laughs> <laughs> in all honesty, um, and so there is a history button. So let, let's go and look at backlogs and um, let's look at our current sprint. And let's just say, for instance, this one, we're ending on the 29th and uh, let's go to the task board and let's pick this user story. Uh, here. Now the Kanban video is finished. So I'm going to move these over here, move these over here. And so now, where is this? Publish video. Now I can go in here. I can actually look at the history and see how long this has taken to do the publication. And by the way, if you want to see the really tight perfect version of what I just walked through in half an hour. You can see it in five minutes in the video that Greg produced uh, that goes over how to do Kanban in Azure DevOps. We just published it and it's in the URL at the end of this presentation. So um, if you move it, you touch it, you change its state, anything you do to it, you can track it. Um, so what do we do if it's not done? Well, we put it in the next sprint and try and get it done. We also take a look at our velocity, how much you know, we try to limit work in progress and make sure that we're taking on reasonable amounts of work. Pretty much like everybody yep. else. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I'm kind of used to that. We've, we've done quite a bit of research here at Combine University on Scrum audiences, and we, we kind of hear that phrase, we'll just put it in the next sprint. You know, that kind of, sometimes you have to do that. It's reality for you. Um, yeah. Okay, so Amy Smith, had a, a quick question. She said, why not use area paths to structure a portfolio backlog and utilize boards to boards to visualize and manage flow of work items? Um, so some of our li larger clients do exactly that. And the area path becomes a filter for the backlog in that project. Um, you know, there's no, there is no reason you can't do that. Uh, one benefit of doing that is that you can use the uh, dashboard um, that comes along with Azure DevOps uh, for those areas. However, you can't go across project. And also the more you subdivide a project into areas and teams, the more complicated it gets and the harder it is to find work and the more steps people have to take to get there. So I tend to err on the side of having too many projects at the top level so that it's just really clear, like if I'm on the software engineering team or the digital and app innovation team, I go here. If I'm on the marketing team, I go here. It's not as obvious when you're um, using areas. That's just a personal preference, but you can definitely use areas with Portfolio++ in Azure DevOps at the portfolio level. Wow, neat. Okay, good. Uh, Alexander Miner had an easy question. Hopefully it's an easy one. Can you map dependencies visually in Portfolio++? 
String dependencies, no, um, but we can show dependencies uh, pretty clearly. Um, let's see. Oh, I'm in the wrong. Let me go to portfolio QA. Let's go here. I believe I have some dependencies here. There we are. Okay, so we've got a dependency here. And if you click on the toggle, you can see the dependency. Now, if you have multiple dependencies, you would see the list here, and it's a hot list. And then you can, you know, go to the item that's the dependency right then and there. Um, so we do not do string dependencies. Um, it's kind of visually unappealing in the roadmap. Uh, so we're using toggles instead. And you can have as many dependencies as you want. The um, dependencies are predicated on uh, predecessors and uh, successors as a link item type uh, to the uh, work item. Excellent. Okay, great. There's a lot of stuff here uh, that, you know, we won't have time to get through. I mean, all of it. I mean, it depends on your availability here, Chris. We have people have been popping in questions that you've been giving answers, which is fascinating. This is a great webinar. Uh, if you want to stick around, folks, you're welcome to. We could answer the questions here, Chris. Or if, you, if you're time box, Chris, because I know you're on vacation, you got other plans, uh, we can definitely come back and answer these questions and send out an email as well. So what's the preference here, Chris, for your schedule and availability? Can you hang uh, around a little bit longer? Yeah, I can hang around a little bit longer. My uh, my true boss has not yet come back to the house. <laughs> so Okay, okay. Uh, when, when, that, when that happens, we will uh, wrap that up then. So we have, let's see how far we can get. We have 22 more questions. For those who want to stay around, stick around. We're going to answer all these questions as much as we can. Uh, Rosario had one more question for us. Uh, the question was, the length of the line in the graph is sized automatically. Is it by the dates? Because today it is necessary to do it manually. So they must be an active uh, ADO user in this case. Okay, so um, there's two ways to generate a roadmap uh, in Portfolio++. Plus Plus, and this also applies to um, uh, Portfolio Kanban in terms of selection criteria. And that is um, to, where is it? Use manual mode. Now, if you use manual mode, um, and it, this is gonna destroy my, my beautiful roadmap here. Oops, I can't, I seem to have lost control of this. There we go. Okay, now I switched it to manual mode. Now it's gonna be picking up start dates and end dates. And as you can see, there's only one Epic that has a start date and an end date defined um here on the card so if let's imagine why is why did we even build this feature when we want to generate the roadmap based on the reality of what's in the backlog and the reason is at the beginning of projects as a program manager i often don't have the luxury of a team to define a backlog that i can then base the roadmap on that's just a huge amount of analysis and it's unreasonable to to do beyond like epics features, maybe user stories to just kind of paint a picture of what it is that you're gonna build. We do this as a consulting organization for clients who say, here's what we're gonna build. But we can't take it much further than that. Um, we can create an iteration path, um, but let's just say you're by yourself uh, in a corporation, you need to be able to paint a picture for the executive team to get budget for your project. And you want to approximate when you think you're gonna be working on things. You can define on epics and features start date and target date and paint a picture using manual mode. It'll pick up these dates and it will just automatically build the bars that size. Um, and that's it. You can just you know create this shell of a of a roadmap that has no interaction with the backlog at all. It just reads the static state. Um, I short of that scenario. I would get away from manual mode as quickly as I could so that the roadmap was being generated out of the state and the and the completion level in the backlog so that you get a true view of what's actually happening inside of Azure DevOps. So that's manual mode. Sure. And that's the other way to calculate these um, epics and features. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. 
so, you know, Amy actually had a question as well, somewhat similar, but it's kind of a little different, I guess. How do delivery plans compare to Portfolio Plus Plus? Well, I really enjoy my standing at Microsoft, and um, that is, uh, <laughs> I think I will just leave it at personal preference. Um, right. What right. we're going for is a Gantt chart styled roadmap that dynamically generates based on what you have in the backlog and the ability to show state through Kanban. Um, it's a little bit of a different feel. Um, I know of teams that have, you know, compared both, you know, go one way or the other. Um, so I, delivery plans is great. It just okay. depends on what you're trying All to right. do. All right. Awesome. Okay. Thanks for that one, Chris. Good yeah. to be safe uh, in terms of how you share that. So yeah, yeah. Um, another question that was asked, is, which is a simple one, but it's worth mentioning here for those who are kind of new to Azure DevOps, uh, is that free to set up and actually start to use? So could someone set up a free ADO account and then grab Portfolio++ Plus Plus and try it out as well? Is that a, a thing they can do? Yes and yes. So you can start an Azure DevOps organization. I think you can have up to six people with basic licenses which you need in order to hit the analytics API, which is something you need to have your administrator turn on or Portfolio++ Plus Plus won't work, uh, turn on the access to the analytics API. Um, and then you can get Portfolio++ Plus Plus for free and you can use it forever, um, but just at the Epic level. Like if I want to put other types of work items on the project, uh, like in the case of um, what I was showing you earlier, got to get this thing out of the way again. Um, like, let's say I wanted to put in features or I wanted to put in stories, you know, something that was really super important that, you know, had a ton of dependencies that everybody was focused on. I want to put that story on my roadmap. Um, you can do that. Um, and so you can try all of this for 28 days for free. So yes to Azure DevOps, yes to Portfolio++, Plus Plus, and yes to trying out the pro services for free. That's awesome. That's oh, awesome. by the way, I like that idea. Of, yeah. Notice right here, that customization that we made in the process template, well, here it is. So um, your process template's super important. Um, you just wanna make sure you've got the right types coming through. That's superb. I have to admit, having like something that you know will have dependencies attached to it, obviously we can't always get rid of our dependencies. Having that visualized is kind of the big, big thing to pay attention to, to make sure things are flowing as well as possible with that thing. Mm -hmm. Mixed in with everything else on your, your roadmap, that's actually pretty helpful. I think that's pretty darn useful for people who say, well, we got to make sure this one thing gets done because it could easily get slowed down. Yeah. I like it. Uh, also, uh, just really quickly here, Alexi uh, said, thanks so much. Great presentation. Lots oh, of good you. content here. Looking forward to seeing you at uh, in San Diego. So Alexi, a fan of yours, will probably see you in San Diego and shake your hand and say thanks. Um, Thank you, Alexi. With that, yeah. Thanks, Alexi. So um, we also have a couple more questions here. So someone anonymous had said, have you thought about highlighting the epics features that are behind the expected state? So they're behind the expected state. Could be good to see at a quick glance, some red color or warning to identify where to focus. Yeah. So things that are coming in late, I guess. Yeah, we, we do have that. So let's say um, this is the customer appreciation release and it's connected to finishing portfolio plus plus release 10. Let's say that we didn't do that. Let's say that the milestone was actually supposed to be done on the 15th. Well, now it shows as uh, not as a diamond, it shows as a triangle with an exclamation mark. And that is your visual indicator that something has gone wrong. And you can color code these things uh, however you want. Um, some people color code them the uh, same as the, as the work item type, but then again, there's lots of work item types. So it's really just a combination of uh, the visual indicator dropping the tray and seeing the name like, oh, we didn't get our customer appreciation release out. So that's how we do it. Now, we've had some in the community ask us to color code cards like red, yellow, green um, or different conditions, but that is not something that we've undertaken at this point. Um, like most things, I say we'll put it on the backlog. Now, that's uh, 
That's not just idle promises. Um, I do want to show um, in the IP backlog, uh, we keep talking about this customer appreciation release and our community. And everybody out there can thank Lisa Galano for championing this release as my co-product owner. And so we have a number of customer requests that we uh, thought, you know, these are really great uh, things that we should put into Portfolio++. Plus Plus. So if you've got ideas for how we could make it better, we'd love to hear. And we will put it in the backlog in the ice box. <laughs> <laughs> Eventually, also, thanks. Thanks, we'll Bruce. To yeah. Okay, and also thanks, Lisa, for for championing this release. I know it's a lot of work to get stuff out the door, so really happy that you guys were able to show this with us today, uh, and so for our audience to kind of understand more about how this stuff works. A um, couple more questions here. We're getting through them. Thank you very much, by the way, folks. This is a lot of great questions. Um, there's a nested feature, apparently. Uh, Alexander Miner was asking. He says it looks like you have a nested feature as a parent of another feature. Typically, ADO recommends against this. Does Portfolio++ plus plus function as expected when this type of relationship is set? So yes, and sort of. I'm not exactly sure what you would be looking for. Um, we do also suggest that you don't nest, you know, epics of epics, features of features, um, because from our point of view, they're all portfolio work items, right? Now, if you have a child, um, let me switch back to, uh, gosh, this thing just keeps getting in the way. Now, let's say that I had a child epic here. Um, it would show up here as a child when I drop this down. Um, if you notice here, there's a black triangle and a black triangle here. So when I drop these to show the children, you won't see a black triangle until it gets to the next selected work item. And selected work items are determined in settings when you choose project and they appear over here. These are selected work items. They will all have a black triangle. And so we're trying to make it simple to see all the children to the next selected item here. So if you had an epic of an epic, it would show up as an epic here. Um, but there wouldn't be any sort of annotation that this is a child epic of this epic. So it would work. I, I think the answer to the question is it works the way I think it should work. <laughs> <laughs> so we can right. show it. But, yeah. Okay. Okay, good. So uh, that hopefully it answers your question, Alex. Uh, Alok had a question for displaying entries on the roadmap based upon the first and last item explanation. Does it mean that every item must have a start and end date populated? I think we kind of answered that to some degree that you don't have to have that. It's dynamic, correct? Well, you don't have to have explicit start and stop dates defined on the work items, but the work items um, at the requirements level need to be in the iteration path so that we can pick up the start and stop dates of the iterations. So you don't have to put start and stop dates on your cards at the requirements level, your user stories, your tasks, et cetera, your product backlog items if you're using Scrum. Um, and so when we see the iteration path of user stories and tasks that are children of features and those features are uh, children of epics, we basically do a left to right search through the entire child um, set of the entire set of relationships from the selected work item down to show all of the work that's occurring um, from end to end across its children. There's a whole yep. lot of data set theory going on behind the scenes here. I bet, I bet. That sounds about right. Okay, yeah. good. So from there, we've got Andre. Uh, Andre had asked, can you build portfolio scenarios? Oh, this, you know, in terms of data set theory, this is kind of interesting. Can you build portfolio scenarios from projects to check out different roadmaps and how they might be able to look? So a little bit of forecasting possibly. Well, it, so um, 
it depends on your permissions. If you have permissions to another project, you can very quickly construct a roadmap in that project to see where things are. If you don't have permissions, you can't see it. And um, let's say, for example, that um, you were an iTrellis employee, an iTrellian, um, and you had access to uh, design and marketing, but not IP. You wouldn't be able to see this roadmap because you don't have access to IP. So if I share a link, if I send you a link to this roadmap and you don't have access to all of the projects and their work items, you won't get to see it. Now that's just something that we have to do um, uh, because we have to follow the Microsoft uh, license, uh, access and your permissions very, very strictly. Yep. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, great. So with that, uh, we have another anonymous question here. Um, it may be a pretty easy answer here. They were unclear how the items were pulled into the dashboard uh, or into the portfolio view here, the roadmap. Mm -hmm. uh, were they lower level items, story items? Was there a roll-up activity here? Just to clarify that maybe a little bit. Yeah. So, um, you know, there are three ways that you can build a roadmap. You can build it by project. You can build it by team. You can build it by query. And this is our, this was our last release. And query's cool. So anything that you can produce through a Wickle query in, in queries over here um, that produces a flat list, those become selected work items. Um, so any any time you, like, let's go here, whoops, and it also stops you from destroying your roadmap by choosing another method of generation. Um, but we'll stick with the one that we've been using. So all of these work items are selected um, here in the settings. And, you know, I can choose this, and then it appears I can choose these, I can choose all of them. Um, and, you know, the bigger your roadmap gets, uh, the worse the performance is going to be. I'll just caution you on that right now. It's just a, it's, it, it gets to a point where it's just physics. I, we think it's as fast as it can go, but we can only get the data in so fast and we still have to process it. So when you build a roadmap, a lot of people oftentimes go to every project and they turn on everything and they want to see this huge wall chart. I mean, at that point, you would hit the same issue of complexity. And so you want to design uh, roadmaps that are point specific to tell a story in my opinion, um, or just show at a high level, you know, here's everything that's going on in a program. You can have multiple roadmaps, um, but the point is this is where you do the selection and settings. Excellent, wow. Okay, so that's, makes sense by the way. I remember back in the day when I was using Project years and years ago, decades ago, and it would sit there and compute all the different scenarios and come out with a complete picture just for a Gantt chart. So I can understand why this would still have a lot of dependency a lot of time going on in the background of process and present things like you're talking about. Right. Um, so, okay, so Andre had had one more question and we're gonna try and get the rest of these pretty quickly here. Um, yeah. Is it possible to create and visualize dependencies between epics? Is yes. that something that you can do? Okay. Yeah. It, um, the answer it, is yes, yeah. Yeah, it's what we, we use the dependency feature that I demonstrated a few minutes ago to do that. Um, so it's a combination of milestones for visibility on the roadmap and then dependencies between work items in the roadmap. And you use that toggle feature I was showing earlier here. So here are, we're going to show dependencies, say OK. And so now, you know, we've got a visual indicator that says, hey, you didn't meet your deadline on this, on this work item. And this one says, hey, I've got a dependency on this work item. So uh, I believe the answer is yes. Okay, great. Um, there is another question here. Uh, Kanban work items are not driven by iterations. Okay, that's not correct at all. That's good. How does the roadmap work for purely Kanban-based features and user stories? So if we drop out the idea uh, of a time box, isn't the timeline for an epic uh, independent of what stages the work items are in? Seems like two um, different questions here, maybe. No, I, I believe that I believe that what we're showing here is um, based on state in the Kanban. 
And as you can see here in the portfolio Kanban, it is not time constrained. So what we're doing is we're showing all of the selected work items and their state. Now, if it's a generated roadmap um, and you've got work items that are not in an iteration path, uh, they won't show up on the roadmap. Um, but I haven't thought about that uh, from a Kanban standpoint. Lisa, any thoughts on that? Yeah. Lisa can unmute herself. Yes. Okay. But I, I agree with you that the Kanban is void of time, right? It's showing the now in terms of what's coming and what's going. And so, um, you know, there's you're kind of bridging into uh, Scrum and, and Sprints at the task board level. Um, that mm -hmm. is time time constrained. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, you know, it looks like there's a, a good chance that some of this is built in, but I think yeah, there probably was a need for an email to Eric or to Lisa and see where it goes from there. Uh, if you want to know more about it, yeah, and, uh, Chris. By the way, so uh, yeah, let's see what. Are, Sorry about that, Chris. Um, another question was uh, kind of a simple one, maybe. Uh, if not, we may want to have people go to the website and look it up. What features do you get with the non-premium version of uh, Portfolio++? Plus Plus? You get everything that doesn't have a blue button next to it when you're using it. Um, you know, our goal was to create a, a road mapping tool initially. Um, and so everybody can do roadmaps for free. Um, now there's limitations on what you can do as part of the freemium model, but everybody can build roadmaps for free. Awesome. Okay, great. And then Lisa, your coworker had mentioned how um, she wanted to mention that there's a snapshot feature to export the roadmap so you can share it with your team. So just in case oh. you need to get it out there, you can do it pretty quickly. That's a good point. So that's here. Um, and uh, here's a snapshot. Uh, of the Kanban. And then here's cool. a snapshot of that same set of selected work items as a roadmap. So you can put these kind of side by side and take a look at them. Um, thank you for pointing that out, Lisa. So I assume that was as part of the uh, data export. And so no, there's no data export. You can share roadmaps, but in the event that someone doesn't have the same permissions as you, you can print a static image of what you want them to see and you can send it to them or post it in SharePoint or do whatever you want. It's a scalar uh, PNG file. Awesome, very cool. Okay, so we're near the end of these questions, by the way, Chris, uh, we've got three more to go here. Um, this is kind of a, I don't know if you have an answer for this. It may be more of a just a gauged answer, but someone asked, you know, at which point in terms of data volume does the performance start to degrade? Like a scale kind of question around how much yeah. data before it starts to go, you know. We've spent a fair amount of time trying to noodle that one out. And right now we are encouraging people in our FAC and on the marketplace page not to select more than 200 work items. Now, if you think about that, that's a lot of work items to put on a high level summary roadmap. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, that's when we start to see serious performance degradation. Um, the other thing is just, you know, do you have the bandwidth? Um, like if you can support this video, you can interact with the cloud pretty easily. Um, but it's also a function of uh, the horsepower on your machine as well as your bandwidth. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And um, one other question, I think we have a big fan here. They said, uh, Chaitan had asked, he said, you know, why is Portfolio++ Plus Plus only with Azure DevOps? Why can't we use it with Jira, Rally, other Kanban tools out there? Is there any special benefits to using uh, Azure DevOps? Well, I think there are. That's uh, part of the reason that we chose to build the extension for Azure DevOps first. Um, I, you know, what was this uh, person's name? Uh, Chaitan. All right. Well, as a consulting organization, I'd be happy to build it for you in Jira. Um, <clears throat> but uh, <laughs> we, we chose Azure DevOps for the most part because um, of the flexibility of the process templates and the ability to 
have features. So it goes epics, features, user stories, tasks. Um, I also like the way that um, uh, Azure DevOps parallels the Scrum Bon framework that I was demonstrating earlier and scales well. So I'm a I'm pretty big fan. Uh, I also like Jira, um, but we had to choose one. So we went with DevOps first for the reasons we've been discussing today. Awesome, awesome, thanks, Chris. All right, well, that's pretty much it for the questions for this round. That is probably the most questions we've ever got for webinar, by the way, folks. So uh, thank you all for the great questions. Thank you, Chris, for walking us through and answering every question. Uh, this mm -hmm. is a really interesting product. Uh, I think people are gonna get a lot out of it. So um, with that, I'd like to wrap it up. Thank you, Chris, for showing up. Chris, any final words before we take off? Uh, yeah, I'm gonna send this to you so you can send it out. We've got a bunch of um, links to all of the materials that we put into this presentation. And again, I really would like to thank our partners at Kanban University for allowing us to present uh, our experience um, with Azure DevOps and how we do Kanban uh, and the software that we built to do it. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you so much. All right, folks, have a great day. We will see you later on. Hopefully you'll, we'll see you at the uh, Kanban Leadership Retreat in San Diego in November. If you can make it, show up. We'll shake hands. See you there. All right. Thanks, Chris. Have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye.